Welcome to the J. Kim Show. This is your host, J. Kim. I am an investor, author, and fitness entrepreneur. And for the first time in Asia, I sit down with the world's most brilliant minds in business, investing, and entrepreneurship. You'll learn all the secrets, strategies, and formulas to becoming a successful entrepreneur directly from the masters. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insight to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. This episode is slightly different than the ones you're all used to hearing on my show, but our guest touches upon a lot of relevant issues that are getting covered in the mainstream media these days, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity to have him on. Today's show guest is Phil Yu, who is the founder of the blog Angry Asian Man. Phil created Angry Asian Man back in 2001 as a personal blog for him to write about the facets of the Asian American community that interested him. Fast forward 16 years later, Phil's site is now one of the most popular Asian American blogs on the web, covering news, pop culture, and media. Angry Asian Man has won numerous awards in new media and is even required reading for some college courses on Asian American studies. Phil's actually not that angry. He's a really nice guy, and he's just passionate, really passionate about highlighting the issues and lives of a community that's often ignored or misrepresented by the mainstream media. I'm interested to hear your thoughts after this episode, so please email me or hit me up on Twitter and let me know what you think. All right, let's get on to the show. Hi, Phil. Thanks so much for coming on the Jay Kim Show. We're excited to speak to you today. For our audience listening that might not have heard of you, maybe you can give us a quick introduction. Uh, who's Phil Yu? And tell us what you do. First of all, thanks for having me on. My name is Phil Yu. I am the founder and editor of Angry Asian Man, which is a blog covering the Asian American community. I like to say it is the um, longest running and most widely read independent blog covering the Asian American community. Uh, I started in 2001. So I've been running it for 16 years. Oh. And, you know, it covers everything from politics, pop culture, current events, you know, news, commentary, kind of just all around encompassing the Asian American experience, written from the perspective of one person, myself. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just, it, you know, it's it's a, uh, it's kind of like, uh, I guess I'm a professional angry Asian man is, what, is how I like to say it. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think, uh, well, first of all, I love the the title because I think it's it's fitting to sort of what you're trying to accomplish there. But so 2000, I mean, back then there weren't really many blogs. So I'm interested to, to hear sort of your experience, uh, why you decided to start it in the first place. And writing a blog consistently is even now in this day and age where blogs are very prevalent is not easy. Uh, so I'm interested to hear, you know, how you were motivated to keep going for 16 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you definitely have to approach it. Like when you're know, when asking about the origins of the blog, you definitely have to approach it from a 2001 perspective yeah. um, because, uh, you know, there weren't a lot of, were not a lot of blogs back then. And in fact, what I, when I started it, I didn't even know what I was doing was referred to as blogging. Yeah, I don't think people called it that. It was like journalism. Yeah, I mean, I think I, like that. I think that that the the term was out there, but you know, it hadn't really reached you know like popular understanding of that that that, that was a thing. And so yeah, when I I started, I think I I honestly I didn't to be honest, I did not know I was starting something. It re really was just an effort to kind of create a space for myself just to express myself. Really, um, I was just out of college and. Um, I'd taken a lot of Asian American studies courses. And so I was kind of on this track, really thinking about uh, my Asian American identity and community and just the things I was seeing in the media and wanted a place to kind of just sound off. And so a lot of it was just ranting or raving or, or just discussing. I mean, just talking about things I was thinking about seeing on, on TV or something like that, say. And, you know, I didn't, I did not expect anyone to read it if i mean if you look at those first couple of entries it really was just like <laughs> just a dashing off a sentence about like did you see this it sucks and then or like sharing a link and um I, i've said this a lot but i i think this is totally true that if like back then you know facebook and twitter and all these other uh, you know social media platforms they did not exist back then right but if they had that's probably where i would have just channeled all of this energy into right like 
because that's kind of what I what people do on Facebook, right? They just share links and you know they rant about something they saw or whatever. And so yeah, if if I had been signed up for one of those services back then, there probably would be no blog, probably be no engagement. But um, as it was, there were there were no platforms, and so I had to kind of create one. And I had like uh, picked up a couple of uh, really just basic HTML coding skills, and so mm-hmm. I launched this website and kind of took it on. And you know, I did not expect anyone to read it. Didn't you know? Maybe some family and friends and uh, casual, you know, internet stumblers. But right. what ended up happening is that it, it kind of it did grow. Like people, like I started hearing from people I did not know and saw the traffic on the site kind of slowly start to tick up. And and it was a really gradual process. But you know, even that those initial followers and that and that and that traffic. I mean, that really emboldened me to keep going and and um, encouraged me to keep writing and. Honestly, when people ask me like, "Oh man, how have you kept it up this long?" the the short answer is just like, "Well, I just I just wrote, and then the next day I wrote again, and then after that I wrote more, and then that was kind of, I mean, just build upon it more and more, and you know, and just kind of doing it because I liked it, you know. I think having zero expectation going into it, you know, not having a grand design to build this site that was that like was going to reach all these people, I like I had no designs on that, so that actually allowed me to just kind of create something and and let it let it be you know and and enjoy it yeah i think that's a good point uh phil because especially nowadays i mean people jump into (laughs) everyone tries to be an entrepreneur or or jump in i'm starting a blog and and uh the real reason that they're probably doing it is because they want to somehow monetize off it quickly or or flip it or or I, I feel like a lot of times nowadays when people start stuff up, they don't really think it through, right? So back then when blogging didn't really even exist and it was kind of at the end of Web 1.0 and, and entering this kind of new phase, but blogging was definitely not commonplace. And, you know, it, I guess it's pretty cool because it was just an outlet for you. And and I think that there's, you know, a lot of crossover with um, with what you were doing earlier back then and an entrepreneur's journey because, you know, it's like you said, you were just doing it, uh, doing it because you you love doing it. And every once in a while you get a comment. And I think that, you know, there's there must have been many times where you were just like, mm, OK, I, I'm just doing this. But, you know, maybe maybe I'll stop one day or maybe today I don't feel like writing. So I'm just not going to put anything up. Right. And but then you'll get a comment. So it's like the little wins, the little victories that that kind of keep you going, right? Day after day. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was because really, honestly, like back then, like what was I really in it for? You know, the the, the feedback loop was pretty, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was pretty shallow. So like um, I didn't really have, uh, you know, I, 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 I there was no, it was like, like I said, no grand design, no master plan. So like what was I really blogging for? You know what I mean? It wasn't like I was building towards something. So the day in and day out of it was just kind of like, you know, doing my thing. And then it's only when you look at it through the lens of time and, and, and where I've come from now, you're like, whoa, that like really was like something happening. And, you know, maybe, maybe yes, a couple of years into it, I was kind of like, this is becoming something. Right. But at least in the beginning, you know, and I I, th- I, I I hope that I still maintain that same spirit, but, uh, you know, of just wanting a place to, to express myself and, 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 and talk it out and have my little carve out my little place in the internet, you know, that's right. kind of what I hope, I hope that still I'm doing this in the spirit of that. That's awesome. So let's take a, a little step back. So you grew up in, on the West coast, yep. your parents were probably first generation immigrants to the U S which is a, a very common right. story. Uh, my parents were the same and I was originally from the Bay area as well. So, um, uh-huh. where are you from? Uh, Wallet Creek. Okay. So just outside of San Fran. Uh-huh. Yeah, my dad used to work for uh, Levi Strauss. So, you know, big, big, big San Fran. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but we moved around a bit. So I think my my experience was a, was a little bit different. And I spent a lot of time on the East Coast. So I didn't really have sort of an Asian community to hang out with. Um, you know, I, and the first time I kind of hung out with Asians was in high school. You know, we were definitely a minority in the school and and then I went to college on the East Coast as well. And and then I moved to Hong Kong. You know, I spent a couple of years in New York and then I moved to Hong Kong. So I've kind of been out of touch with, with a lot of what's going on in the Asian community in the States. But having said that, I do remember, 
I think I first heard about you. So that so there was like a there was I think it was early two thousands. There was something with Abercrombie, right? There was a uh, there was an event, and I think that's where uh-huh. I first yeah. saw. That might have been the first sort of data point where that put your blog on the map because I think that's where I saw you. But then I kind of I didn't follow you consistently after that. But maybe you can you can talk about what happened there. Yeah, well, I, I think that sounds about right I, it, because uh, that incident was kind of the first was kind of a turning point for my blog. But it was also yeah for a lot of people it was the first time they'd ever seen the blog and got exposure to it. So this was back in uh, it was like two thousand two, I think, and Abercrombie and Fitch, right, clothing the clothing company. They released this line of T-shirts with these Asian-themed designs. And I think people can look at them and say that they were pretty racist, actually. (laughs) The one that everybody remembers is advertising a fake laundry service called the Wong Brothers. And then it had this, you know, this, this caricature, stereotypical character of like uh, an Asian guy with, with buck, buck teeth, slanted eyes, yeah. and those like those conical Asian, Asian hats, you know. And the, the slogan said, two Wongs can make it white. And yeah, they, they sold these shirts on uh, at Abercrombie. And the movement to sort of like protest these shirts and, and speak out against them, it really started with college students. Because, right. you know, that's kind of Abercrombie's like, you know, key demographic, you know, mm-hmm. but the, I got wind of it through some student groups, Asian American student groups. And I, I, I wrote a post about it, you know, I put up images of all the shirts. And then at the end of the post, almost kind of as an afterthought, I wrote, I put up uh, the corporate contact information for Abercrombie and <laughs> Fitch. It's, you know, it's just, it was readily available on the website. And, and I just put it up and I said, you know, if you feel the same way I do about these shirts. Like, let let Abercrombie know. And you know what? Give them hell. You know, it, it became a whole thing. And and I was I was certainly not the only blogger who covered this. Like, there are plenty of people online who are talking about this. But, you know, it grew to a movement where, like, largely led by Asian American student groups, there were, like, physical protests outside of Abercrombie and Fitch stores. And Abercrombie eventually... They they pulled the shirts from shelves and they released kind of this really stupid uh, press release, which um, they said, and I quote, uh, they said, we thought that Asians would love these shirts. And it was definitely <laughs> like a moment where um, I suddenly did get a lot of traffic to the side because uh, people were sharing the link, you know, t- like, and this is this is before um, – you know, social media really took off. Yeah. So there was no way to share it other than email. email right. And so people were emailing the link to my blog because that's where the image of all the shirts were, you know. And so people were just sharing to their friends like, hey, check out, this is whack, you know. And then they would share the, share the link. And so I got a lot of traffic. And But it was also like a really important moment for me in the life of the site. Like I, I, I'd only been doing the blog for about a year, year and a half maybe. and But it was the first time I really, I had written anything that it kind of, you know, it, 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 that illustrated to me like, whoa, I can actually write something and move people to action, you know, uh, because right. of it. You know, it wasn't, you know, up to then, I think it it largely been me just kind of like from my perch, like, you know, ranting or, or raving or, right. or, or, you know, celebrating something. But it was really just like throwing stones, you know, for my vantage point. But I think it was the first time I was like, whoa, I'm part of this larger community. They're reading this blog and I can I can move people to action through the things I'm saying through this blog. So it was, it was actually a really powerful illustration of and kind of a. Uh, something that kind of sent the blog on a, on a, a, in a, in a different direction from there on. Like I was really seeing it as more of like a space where I could do something for a, a larger community, you know? Yeah. So it's like proof of concept, which is great. And it must've made you, made you feel really, really good about what you, you know, had started. And then also sort of proving the power of the internet at a very, very early and pre social media power of the internet. Right. So right. I think that's, that's a pretty cool story. You know, this is interesting because, you know, Phil, being Asian American, I think that my personal experience growing up, you know, in the States and, you know, my parents, they, they weren't, they were always like, okay, we're, we're immigrants in this country. So you just, just keep your head down. Like, don't make a, you know, don't, don't, don't make a big stink. Just, just, just don't get into trouble, you know, do just, just try to fit in. Uh, you know, you know, the usual like, oh, you have to work twice as hard because you're, you're a minority, blah, blah, blah. So it's almost like, and I think this, this, this is quite common with people in our generation, you know, we're around the same age. I think that, you know, for the first generation immigrants, our parents that came to the, to the States, it was all about survival, right? And they were just like, whatever we have to do to survive, you know, I mean, it's funny, they, 
all <laughs> that generation, you know, they didn't call it entrepreneurship, even though they were all entrepreneurs. It's like entrepreneurship is right. a funny term that everyone likes to throw around and, and it's cool right. now, you know, I mean, that was, that was like survival, but they were all yeah. brilliant entrepreneurs, oh. you know, they were all small business owners and, right, right. and, and, and accomplished much, much, much more than many of, of us have in this day. But yeah, I think it's kind of funny because, because people glamorize uh entrepreneurship now but but back then it right. was just it's just it's just immigrant hustle right <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly it was just life right survival so yeah. was there a point where you know i'm curious to to hear what what your upbringing was and if you're if if you're if if it was similar to mine and there was a, a you know were your parents supportive of what you were doing you know because i think my parents would have been like you know shut that site down like keep your head down what are you doing you know like don't don't cause waves Get back to right. working in your corporate job. <laughs> well, the story of that, I mean, my parents' attitude toward the work I do and then my upbringing, it's just like, like kind of two different things. Uh, um, so, I mean, I totally understand what you're saying in terms of like the attitude of, you know, first gen- generation Americans when they're immigrants, they come and I mean, they have that attitude of keeping your head down, just doing the work and, and just grind it out, you know, and uh, I see that and I'm like, well, can you blame them? I mean, I, I totally understand that, right? It's like, mm-hmm. and you, what you say about survival mode, for so many people, uh, yeah, like why, like why would you do something to stick your neck out? And because like, there's so many things stacked against you. You know, you're you're, you're kind of you're kind of getting to the game like really late. You right. know, in terms of like you know you're, and then and not and oftentimes it's there's language barriers. There's just like you know you're just not, uh, you're coming from a different place. And for sure, to provide for your family, it's easiest to take the path that has you know, sort of the, the most things laid out for you, right? right. Like go to school, yep. get a job, do the, like, you know, why would you do something that has so many unknowns, mm-hmm. you know? And so for sure, like a, a traditional career path for me would have made everybody so much more happy <laughs> uh, in my life. But that's not to say my parents weren't supportive of the things that I do, because I, I have to, to be honest, they were, they've always been super, like not, if, if, even if they didn't understand, they've always been really supportive of the things that like I, I that I was pursuing and, and, and was passionate about. And mm-hmm. they knew that like, that I was pursuing things that would make me happy. And I, I do. And I think like just hearing stories from other, uh, from friends and stuff about their, their Asian American parents. I, I, I think my parents were a little bit out of the ordinary in that sense. You know, they let me go to a private institution out of state to study right. radio, TV, film of all things, you know, they must've been like, we are out of our minds. I can't believe we're letting <laughs> them do this, but, um, but they were, you know, they, said they they were so supportive and I, I have to give them all the credit for that, you know, and my parents were, were entrepreneurs, you know, they own stores, they own shops, like, right. you know, and businesses and stuff like that. And they, you know, they did that, they did their own version of the immigrant hustle. But, yeah. you know, if you yeah. think about it, like, if you look at the immigrant story in general, like, <laughs> that takes so much more risk than any of the things that we could do here in the, you know, like yeah. a, a quote unquote risky career path, like dropping everything in your home country, the country you're born in, <laughs> leaving all your friends behind yeah. to go to some place where you don't know that many people, you can barely speak the language, you know, and then and then start from scratch. I'm like, that is so much more risky and brave than anything I could have really done, you know, Absolutely. than the sheltered like path of school growing up here and you know whatever you know yeah. i always probably would have landed on my feet somewhere along the way yeah. that for them i think that's a nuclear risk you know it's so oh, yeah. it's so so all the immigrants who come to do that i mean that's so gangster you know it's like <laughs> it's it's not I, I, like if you look at it that way i'm like well it's, i'm kind of just going in the spirit of what you guys did you know and you know within my own path right yeah i mean it's all about perspective right it's like right oh, right i don't know should i should, this is risky should i should i start a blog i don't know right it's like okay come on like <laughs> just yeah. start the damn blog right <laughs> but when i so but and, and the, the other thing is that so in terms of what they think about what i do and and their approval of that i i i I wasn't pursuing it as my career. You know, it was just kind of this thing I was doing for fun. And then when it really started to take off and become an actual, like, a personal and professional uh, pursuit, like something I was very passionate about, and, and I, I started getting a reputation for it, that's when they kind of found Like, for the longest time, I actually kept it, didn't really tell them about it. Not that I was, like, trying to hide it from them, but honestly, I was, I, I thought, I was like, they're not going to get it. You know, they're just, they're not going to, it's like, why, you know, why spend the energy of trying to explain it? This thing I'm doing in the computer, like, uh, yeah, exactly. but when they, fa- but when they did find out about it, uh, it was because I got some press in the Washington post and they saw the article and they were like, Oh, this sounds, this sounds interesting. Like, you know, they're like, Oh, angry Asian man. Okay. And yeah. they were like, 
you know, they were like, they, they didn't disapprove. They, they were just like, that's cool. Okay. <laughs> years later, like a couple years back, actually, I got an article written about me, though, in the Korea Daily, which oh, was nice. like, that was, that was it. You know what I mean? Like the Washington Post, that's nothing. Yeah. The, <laughs> the Korea Daily, that was kind of the, <laughs> the apex of like achievement for me. I mean, cause, cause you know, it was like, I got written about in, 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 a, new, a newspaper that they they read and uh, that their peers read in the in the language in their first language, you know, and th- and then finally they could ex- probably explain to their friends what I actually did for a living, <laughs> you know, like all that kind of lined up. And now I was legit, right? No, exactly, exactly, because it's like <laughs> for them. And I was laughing because when you were saying like, oh, my parents let me go a non traditional route, I was like, God, I can't imagine how they must have felt at their their get togethers with their peers like what you know i mean that's that's like a it's it's like a it's like a beauty contest right oh my son goes to harvard uh, yeah. my my daughter does this my son's a doctor blah 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 you know uh, my son you know started a blog called angry asian man so so yeah you finally arrived man that was your point <laughs> that was your moment yeah i think up to then they probably spoke about my work in very vague terms yeah. like he does internet stuff or something you know like <laughs> that's awesome. it's been super super big <laughs> brilliant okay so um thanks for sharing that story phil that's awesome so fast forward now i mean 16 years later blogs going strong you're obviously uh have a very strong social media following and i think the the issues that you you talk about are are becoming more and more relevant especially in this day and age i mean uh, that that data point of the Abercrombie and Fitch uh, snafu that you know that sort of thing you would think never could never happen in this day and age and yet we still see things like that happening so two things first of all I know you just started a podcast yourself so congratulations and maybe we could talk yeah. about that a little bit and I'm a podcaster so sure. so um, I'm I'm excited when I I see new podcasts coming up and and I listened to a couple episodes of your podcast called uh, They Call Us Bruce. Um, yep. so first of all, what, what is the name? Uh, why, why'd you, why that name? Obviously I think it's Bruce Lee reference. And, uh, what do you talk about on your show? First of all, it's called, they call us Bruce, which is a reference to it. An old 80, obscure eighties cult movie, um, called they call me Bruce. Mm. A lot of people don't know about this, but there was a, in, in the eighties, there was a Korean American comedian named Johnny Yoon who, um, mm-hmm. He made this uh, comedy. It's kind of a really broad comedy, but it was about him like always being mistaken for Bruce Lee and, you know, and then him sort of turning his on his head and people he would like try to convince people that he knew martial arts uh, so they wouldn't (laughs) mess with him. And there's a lot of stuff about, you know, it's about like Asian identity and uh, stereotypes and and race. It's all it's, you know, and and all boiled down in this like really broad um, kind of dumb comedy. And so, uh, yeah, when we were thinking of names for this podcast, we thought They Call Us Bruce would be great. I, so I co-host this with my friend, good friend, uh, writer and columnist Jeff Yang, who's, uh-huh. who's kind of um, – who's long been in sort of covering the Asian American and Asian American pop culture beat for, for even longer than I have. And uh, right. he's been – he's you know, over the years, we've become very good friends. And one thing that happens between us is that when we get, when we get together, because we're – both of us are so steeped in, in, in this and so – interested in talking about Asian America and particularly Asian American pop culture, media, entertainment, is that when we get together, we always have these really long conversations, very sometimes very nerdy, very deep dive between us. And I thought, you know, I love podcasts and I love listening to podcasts. And um, I just thought uh, I, I've been meaning to, one, like start something up like a podcast and, and two, like wanting to work with Jeff just as a friend. Um, we've never actually formally worked together. So uh, I thought like, wow, why don't we just have some conversations where we uh, just record it, you know, we'll record right. the conversation, yeah. basically it, you know, keep it free and, and, and start it up. And we had been talking about it for the longest time and it kind of came to the point where we needed to stop talking about it and stop thinking about it and actually do it. So it came together actually rather haphazardly because in recent weeks as, as of this recording, like we, uh, a lot of things have kind of popped up that we wanted to talk about. And so we just kind of like, Hey, what are you doing this Saturday? Let, let's, I'll, I'll bring my mic over. Let's, let's, we'll talk. And so <laughs> the first couple of episodes are reflective of that because they sound like they sound terrible. Um, yeah. but, uh, you know, we are very passionate, but the actual sound quality is just really garbage. Um, but you know, we, 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 we kind of just decided we needed to, we needed to just start it because doing so and putting the episode out, at least those first episodes out there, it would actually hold us to doing it, you That's know, right. um, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of make us, 
start something and, and be very public about it. And then between my following and and Jeff's following, and um, which uh, largely overlapped too, um, I think we were able to sort of like you know create something and and start something up like kind of re- relatively quickly, even though like say the technical aspects weren't there, but at least the social aspects were there and. Um, the content, surely, I hope, was the most important part was there. So, um, yeah, as of as of this as of, we're recording this now, our our third episode has come out, and uh, you know, I've, I've actually really enjoyed doing it. So, it's hopefully we'll keep it going. Yeah, I, I love the format. Like you said, it's it's literally it, it it's just two bodies sitting around talking as if as if you're just having an everyday conversation in your living room. Uh, so I love yeah, the, yeah, the casual format of it, and for my listeners listening in they just did a a pretty evocative episode on number three which is called uh ghost in the shell so there's a lot of issues right now out there that you've probably heard about or read about regarding the scene and asian representation in hollywood films uh there was the great wall which was that film with matt damon uh that came out and then also ghost in the shell which is the big buzz right now so if you want to hear Phil's views, uh, the angry Asian man's views, then check out his new podcast. They call us Bruce. I'll definitely be subscribing and, and following you, Phil. Um, I think it's Thank you. Great, yes. Really good. Well, Phil, thanks for coming on the show. We have to look to wrap up. Uh, just a couple more questions for you before we go. The first is, in addition to the podcast that you launched and you know your, the, the work that you're continuing to do, the great work that you're doing at Angry Asian Men, what, what are some of the other things you're working on or goals that you have for 2017 and into the future? You know, I mean, maybe this is a, a broad-based question of what your ultimate goal is for Angry Asian Man uh, and the work that you do. Maybe you could just talk about how you see this whole thing playing out. What's your ideal end game or, you know, metric of success for the, for the blog? Yeah. Um, well, I, I honestly, I'd like to just keep doing what I'm doing and do it better and just keep going with the blog. I mean, there's no shortage of things that need to be covered and, and get people in, you know aware of and um, spread the word about stuff happening within the community. So there's, I mean, it, Asian America is, will always be here and just keep evolving. So, and I, you know, I, I, I would love to be a facilitator that keeps people sort of aware and it keeps it going. I, I think that in terms of like other things that I'd like to keep going to, like, well, the podcast was a big step of just branching out and trying other media. It, you know, it would be great to branch out and say video or something like that yep. on YouTube. You know, honestly, I would love to write a book. Like <laughs> that would be, you know, it, it'd be a, gr- a great way of sort of like summing up a lot of the things that I've talked about and experience and, and sharing, sharing some of that. Um, but the big thing is like time totally eludes. I'm so busy and I don't like, I, I barely like launching the podcast on top of what I was already doing was like, was, was, was a crazy endeavor. And, you know, I, I somehow, you know, you just got to find the way and make some time. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things where, uh, well, you're talking about the podcast. It, it was the same. I had the same experience. It's like, um, there's this whole thing of jumping first or leaping first or, it's like in Jeopardy where you press the button before you even know the answer and then you kind of have to come up with it, you know, in the process. So it does uh-huh. hold you accountable, though. So I think it's great that you're doing that. Well, yeah, I mean, last question is, I mean, obviously, where can people find you, follow you, you and connect with you if they want to learn a little bit more about the angry Asian man who's actually a, a nice guy? Not not that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, you can find me at angryasianman.com. That's where the bulk of the work kind of goes into. You can find me on most of the mm-hmm. social media platforms at, at angryasianman. So that's okay. primarily Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Okay, awesome. Well, great. Thanks, Phil. Thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate having you on the show and uh, best of luck with everything that you're doing. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. All the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show. I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at jkimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week.
This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness.